Fleck is Vice President and General Manager of the Jacobs Technology NASA Test and Evaluation Contract Group at NASA White Sands Test Facility in New Mexico. White Sands Test Facility provides rocket propulsion and materials component testing for the Space Shuttle, International Space Station, and commercial and military systems. He began his career in 1979 supporting rocket testing activities in the, at the United States Air Force's Arnold Engineering Development Center. From 2003 to 2006, he served as branch manager investment project manager for aerospace testing alliance, the joint venture support contractor at AEDC, which, for which Jacob Technology is managing partner. In this role, Keith was responsible for facility and infrastructure planning to support test operations, which included management of a $100 million annual budget. From 1996 to 2003, Keith served as test and facility support department chief engineer, deputy director, and investment program section manager. Keith earned a BS in mechanics engineering from Christian Brothers University, 1978, and MS in Engineering Manager from the University of Tennessee. So that I'd like to introduce you. So if we drill down 
uh, again, to Jacob's technology, you see 20 or so uh, enterprise segments that we manage across the, the United States, focused primarily on DOD, NASA, automotive, just to name a few of those. Um, and then if we cut it even uh, one more slice down to what we do in the rocket community, you see these locations. I'm going to start out uh, over on the left at Edwards Air Force Base where we manage the uh, rocket facilities for the U.S. Air Force um, at their uh, AFRL, Air Force Rocket Labs. Um, the next one is the NASA White Sands Test Facility Contract, which uh, just uh, down the way at, uh, uh, outside of Las Cruces, New Mexico, that's for NASA. We manage the uh, contracts at uh, uh, NASA Stennis, uh, the rocket stands there down in uh, south of Mississippi. And then moving on up to uh, Marshall, we, we manage the rocket stands there. Uh, Arnold Engineering Development Center, which up in Middle Tennessee. And then we have a, uh, an office in Tulsa, Tennessee, that does a lot of uh, design, development, and construction of the same kind of uh, facility. So um, hopefully you've got the sense that Jacobs is a very broad company. Uh, if you want rocket science, uh, we're the company that, that can, can deliver that for you. Uh, we really are the, uh, the, the, the deliverers of that capability for NASA and DOD. Uh, but you also have got a sense that uh, we're a big company. Um, we've got 55,000 employees. We do $12 billion of annual revenue. We work 200 uh, locations across the globe. So there's a lot of variety in, in the capabilities that you can explore in Texas. Uh, so I got a, a short video that I want to show you, and uh, hopefully it will uh, help you understand a little bit why you might want to get into this business.
those thrusters are firing a little well. Okay, we're going to just pour the, uh, the dock with the International Space Station. Uh, they give this little uh, pitch maneuver to, to do a real good inspection. But some interesting things there. Uh, I saw that video. Uh, John Casper, uh, an astronaut, uh, shared it with us uh, about a month ago, and I thought it was really impressive. Uh, the, the amount of energy that you that you sense in those solids when they go off, and just the views that, uh, that we've been able to to get uh, with the, the new uh, cameras that have been added. It was really, really impressive. So, thought y'all get a, uh, a chance to see that now. If that doesn't convince you, you want to get into rocket science, I want to welcome you. Send a plant uh, 
uh, fabrication plant or a, 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 a liquid methane mining plant to Mars in advance so that when the astronauts got there, their propellant was already there. That solves two problems. One, it's already there and ready to go. And the second is you don't have to take a look at it. And that costs money to get the access. So that's some liquid oxygen, liquid methane development that we're doing. And then down here you can see the, uh, the forward pod of the show. Uh, that shows us the reaction control engines that are being fired uh, on that forward pod. And those use hyperbolic propellants. Hyperbolics are propellants that when they are mixed, they don't like one another, or they like one another, I agree you want to uh, put it in perspective, but they, they all are not. So you get, you get uh, an explosion when that happens. So you gotta be very careful with them, but they're very reliable. You know, when you open this valve and this valve, and you put those uh, propellants together, you're gonna get the ignition. Uh, in this case, we're using monometal hydrazine and nitrogen tetroxide. Those are the typical <coughs> So there's some examples of some liquids. Um, a little different in terms of, you don't have your um, oxidizer and fuel together like you do in solids, you have them separate. So you have a tank of liquid hydrogen, you have a tank of liquid oxygen, now you've got to have pumps to pump this into the engine, you have to have pressurization systems to push it out maybe. Uh, so you have to have a completely different set of, uh, of uh, equipment to, to make the, uh, the vehicle uh, work. Propellants are, um, are injected through the plates, uh, atomized into a chamber, they're ignited, and then uh, you get the same performance in terms of the gas uh, leaving the chamber pressure through a diverging, uh, a converging, diverging nozzle, and, uh, and you get your drug. It's a little different, uh, but uh, uh, they have their purpose as well. Now these are, are good for, you want to start, you want to stop, you want to start, you want to stop. And they deliver uh, ISP, different uh, different level of ISP, which we'll talk about in a minute as well. Um, what about vehicle inter integration? So, uh, like I said, when you're when you have a stack of a satellite or a, a vehicle with a satellite on the top, you, you have multiple stages. So you got your first stage, and you got to worry about the integration of that first stage to the second stage. Okay, when they come apart, they're going to come apart properly. Is something going to uh, cause a failure? And, some impact on some uh, particular component, well, that would be a bad day. Uh, so, and, and here you can see a, a nested uh, set of, of nozzles that will extend once the vehicle is apart. Matter of fact, in February, NASA had a failure of a Tor Taurus rocket um, in that it was uh, carrying a uh, carbon observatory um, satellite, and uh, the, the fairing, you can see the, the fairing up at the very top, which covers the satellite. Uh, the frame uh, component there uh, failed and didn't operate properly, so the fairings didn't come open and lost the satellite. I don't know what the cost was, but probably in the half a billion dollars. Uh, so it would be very expensive if something doesn't go just right as, as it's planned. So there's some uh, discussion about the vehicle in there. Um, well, we're going with handles. So the first thing is you get uh, a vehicle into low Earth orbit, right? So it's, it's going around the old Earth at 150, 200 miles above <coughs> the surface. Uh, well, if you want to place that, that vehicle, that satellite in geosynchronous orbit, then you've got a couple of burns that you got to do. You see the first one here, where we're going to uh, need about uh, 8,000 feet per second of tangential velocity <coughs> at LEO, low Earth orbit, so you get that burn, and then and it goes on out to uh, the apogee, that's the perigee, and then it gets to the apogee, and you get, uh, was it, 5,000 feet per second tangential burn, and now you've got a satellite that's in zero synchronous orbit, in other words, uh, it's always uh, directly above. Uh, so there's an option, and, and these, are, these are good options, especially the perigee and the apogee burns are good for solids, because you know exactly how much uh, impulse you need that vehicle at those velocities. So there's you an example of uh, orbital mechanics. Or you might be interested in the propellant chemistry. I don't know if we have any chemists here, uh, but that's another option. And I didn't talk about uh, plasma engines or nuclear propulsion. Uh, the point is there are a lot of opportunities and there's a lot of diversity uh, in this uh, area of rocket propulsion uh, systems. Uh, 
So that's a little introduction to, to some of the aspects. Um, it can be a very simple thing, okay? We're going to inject some propellant into a chamber. We're going to burn it. It's going to go out the exhaust nozzle. And uh, we can use uh, Newton's laws to predict that. That's okay? pretty simple. We can calculate ISP, which is the, the lower formula there, and we can compare the performance of this solid to that liquid or this solid to that solid. Very simple way of understanding what impulse uh, this particular vehicle is delivering uh, compared to what you might need. Okay? So it's, it can be a very simple thing, uh, but it can be very, very complicated. Uh, the first, uh, first uh, major problem we had there with the, the show was a Challenger in 1986. Many of you probably don't even remember that first thing. Uh, we lost a vehicle on ascent and uh, we lost seven natural. That was a very devastating day for the uh, NASA uh, human space program. Uh, and then uh, in 03, uh, we lost Columbia on uh, re entry as, as represented by uh, this uh, radar imagery. Another bad day, we lost seven astronauts. So it's a very complicated business, and it's a very serious business when you're dealing with, especially land flight. And we talked about losing a half a half a billion dollar satellite well. That, that hurts, but it doesn't hurt like this hurts. So it's a very serious business for you. All right. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, why we test, why we do these simulated tests, and then why we test at altitude versus just doing it here as a, as a ground test. So uh, one thought is that, that we've learned over and over again that you really should test before you fly. Uh, now I'm sure that that, uh, that satellite that, that we lost in February, they had done some tests at frameable unit that were really not properly function. Uh, but it's far uh, it's far better for the industry if you can demonstrate and understand uh, in a developmental nature what needs to be uh, checked out prior to a flight test and a failure. So we'll do many uh, ground tests uh, from a component level into a completely integrated. Uh, the capability, and then you'll qualify that, which gets you as close as possible to flight conditions as you possibly can. Um, uh, Aviation Week made a statement here uh, about their support of uh, test before flight, and uh, there is a place for computational simulations, no doubt, but it doesn't necessarily take the place uh, of, uh, of uh, ground testing that needs to be done. So we'll talk a little bit about uh, some of the aspects uh, that, that we might be interested in, and one is low pressure. At uh, a vehicle flying in space is near perfect vacuum, and, and so that's a significant uh, impact to the, the vehicle uh, in terms of how it performs uh, versus a ground test. Uh, uh, low heat transfer uh, issues. Things that are cold get colder, things that are hot get hotter. We need to be testing under those kind of environmental uh, environments. And at, at the end of the day, you're looking for structural integrity. Does this vehicle perform in the environment that it's going to be placed in? And, uh, and then you can uh, start thinking about, well, is, is it operable? Uh, have we done everything we can to make it so that it will survive in the environment? A uh, little bit uh, of discussion about uh, effects of altitude on nozzle performance, for example. In the top uh, uh, figure, you see a, a vehicle in flight and the nozzle uh, is represented as flowing fluid, as it will. You want to get the most performance out of, out of your vehicle, you expand the gas as much as it will expand in that flight environment. Well, a typical altitude test will be at about 100,000 feet. 100,000 feet is about 0.16 psi absolute. Uh, and, and as represented by this lower graph, it'll also flow fluid. At that pressure, it will, uh, it, it, the gas will be allowed to expand uh, in the, uh, uh, the nozzle completely. So you can get a pretty close uh, performance uh, measurement there. Um, unlike in the middle, if you test that same vehicle at sea level, the atmosphere is at 14.7 or 14.2, wherever you're at uh, on Earth here, uh, will require you to truncate that nozzle because that little bit of atmosphere difference will uh, push on the plunger and prevent it from filling up that nozzle. You don't truncate it or cut it off, and you can get some recirculation and even, even some failures uh, due to that environment. And that's not the environment that the vehicle is going to see uh, when it flies. Uh, so, in an altitude.
two kind of test, we can we can replicate 99 and a half percent of uh, back and thrust. Uh, versus if we do it at at, uh, at, at sea level, then we can only get 80 percent of the back and thrust. We don't want to be we don't want to be uh, estimating that large of a percentage increase to try to determine what the vehicle is going to see during flight. Uh, another aspect is. Uh, uh, how do we get the vehicle up and start it? How do we ignite it? And, and, and the solids specifically, uh, they're what we call igniters. They're little small hot gas generators. Uh, it takes pressure and temperature to get a, a solid propellant um, uh, so that it's burning on itself. Uh, so uh, if we're starting at, uh, at ambient up here that represents the, the uh, yellow uh, area, you can see what, it, what energy it might take to get the propellant so that it uh, self-sustains uh, ignition. Versus doing that at, at uh, altitude, as represented by this blue curve, it takes a lot more energy because you've got to fill that chamber up that's at a lower pressure. So a simple thing like that needs to be tested and verified. You can do analysis to determine what, what size ignorer you want to put in there, but you better test it just to make sure. Uh, this is a typical um, uh, thrust curve that we would see uh, for a uh, ballistic type uh, vehicle and the, the upper curve, the blue curve is a uh, uh, thrust or uh, chamber pressure and uh, the red curve is represented as what we can actually measure uh, in a uh, test at uh, a vacuum chamber uh, and then you can see the lower black line is the 80% uh, curve that, that we can uh, replicate at sea level. And you don't want to be estimating that large uh, percentage increase uh, from sea level to, uh, to uh, what the performance of the vehicle is going to be in flight. Uh, just a second, this facility I'm pretty proud of uh, being involved in. Uh, $183 million facility that was constructed in the, uh, the 80s. Uh, it's designed to test uh, solid propellant rocket motors, uh, 80,000 pounds. Class 1.1 propellant. Uh, that type of propellant is, is detonable. You take a hammer and you hit a piece of it, it will detonate. Uh, versus a uh, another type of solid propellant uh, that's a mass fire. You, you can hit a hammer and it will detonate, but it might catch on fire. Um, so we can test uh, very, very large uh, solid propellant rocket motors there, up to half a million pounds of, of axial thrust. Uh, the test cell, which is on the other side of these. This uh, blast wall here is uh, 26 feet diameter to 2 feet long. So it's huge and can, can handle uh, large vehicles. Uh, you see a lot of the exhaust stuff in there to, to condition the, uh, the, the products uh, of exhaust. Uh, big dehumidification cooler there. I think it's about 4 million uh, cubic feet. It's 250 feet in diameter, 100 feet tall. Uh, and the water tank there is 3 million gallons of water that we can dump in uh, 60 seconds. Million gallons. So, uh, very, very impressive facility. Uh, really proud to, to uh, be a part of the, the construction, designing and construction of that facility. With that, uh, that's my uh, that's my discussion this morning. Hopefully, it introduced you to uh, a number of possibilities that might be out there. Um, I think we have some time for some questions, and uh, if you have any specific uh, interest, don't throw a bunch of uh, formulas at me. I'm, uh, Long time been out of school, so uh, I've lost a lot of that. And, and you'll find in your careers, if you move into management, especially uh, understanding uh, facilities is really important uh, because uh, it helps you better manage later uh, because you can understand uh, the complexity of the of facilities and the problems uh, that occur in ground testing. So, with that.
it was officially a merger, but uh, over a period of time, we lost the Score Group name. Uh, we were Score Group Technology for a long time, then we became Jacob Score Group, and then we became uh, Jacob. Score Group is hard to say. Score Group is hard to say. Yeah. 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 But, uh, uh, but Score Group is now Jacob's Technology. If you oh, okay. And Jacob's Technology is the aerospace and defense, defense part of Jacob's engineering. Okay. And matter of fact, we're, um, we're 20% of the workforce of Jacob's. Uh, Jacob's Technology has over 11,000 employees. Uh, yeah, yeah, you can go to, to Jacob's.com. And I don't know, you got a booth. Yeah, you're going to have a booth tomorrow. Yes, sir. Uh, so Nick Green will be around, uh, and so you can you, you can go to Jacobs.com or Jacobstechnology.com and see what uh, kind of uh, jobs that, that we have out there. Yes, Mary. Um, could you speak to how Jacobs and other companies that are involved in the development of manned space flight utilize cooperative education and students out of universities to help them to research the areas that they might be interested in going into as professional engineers? Okay. Uh, it, it is somewhat dependent on the, uh, the, the operational segment as to how we deploy that or how we work with the universities for co-op programs. Um, we are, uh, we're an organization that, uh, that, that has what we call segments. And the NASA uh, test and evaluation contract over at uh, Las Cruces is a segment. Uh, Grant Adams here manages the segment at Langley. Uh, and so we have, we have 20 of these segments around the, the country. So each, each segment is, is a little, uh, little business, if you will, uh, that we, we work uh, within the local community. Not only uh, in addition to community support, also with the universities. Uh, in my case, at uh, in Las Cruces, we work a lot with the New Mexico State University. Uh, we have a co-op program. Uh, we work with the, the Space Grant Consortium uh, there at the local university, uh, we have the student launch program which they have uh, there. Uh, they also host an international symposium for personal and commercial space flight, which we're a, uh, a sponsor for. Um, so it, it depends on the segment. We've been fortunate enough to, to work with the Mexico State here locally or, or just uh, four hours down the road. Uh, and I think we have nine co-ops right now. Is that, is that about right? Yes. Uh, and, and nine's a lot. For a segment that has 350 employees, uh, and so that that's one way for us to uh, to interact with the uh, uh, the, the universities. Um, most uh, our most co-op employees become full-time employees uh, for for a few reasons. One is they like the work we do, uh, and second, uh, I think we're we're really a really great company to work for. Think anything else on that uh, in terms of what we're doing globally in terms of co-op programs or, or, or work with the university. Nick's more familiar with what we're doing Jacob's technology as a whole. See, if I can divert a question over to him, it's good. <laughs> well, uh, this last year we had 200 students in our program, both co-ops and interns, and Keith's uh, area of the country where you guys are right here is, is starting to develop, starting to grow, and we're starting to offer more opportunities for students. But um, Johnson Space Flight Center in Houston had about 35 students this last year. Uh, uh, our Air Force Base, where he was talking about, where you saw that J6 test facility, they have about 20 to 25 students. And just talk to me tomorrow about uh, if you want to learn more about that. But uh, we are really trying to work with schools, even the University of Arizona and others, about uh, what opportunities we have to work with you. We haven't really done a lot of outreach uh, before two years ago, and so we're really coming to these events and trying to help under, help us understand what you want and what you're looking for, and so it's as much as us telling you what we do and us learning what you do. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, right. uh, I'm, I work out Langley up in uh, Southern Virginia, and the uh, NASA site there has got one of the strongest
tracking systems for eagles. It's, it's pretty odd the way it's developed, but we do, uh, they do a lot of aerospace stuff. They do a lot of uh, aeronautics, FAA kind of stuff. So uh, what will happen is uh, the sponsors of people who have things they're studying will write a paper, and then uh, individuals like yourself will uh, send a resume and in an interest in an area that some scientists or researchers are doing. So I would, uh, if you're interested in doing some of our Which systems uh, would Jacobs Technology have like a strong suit in, or is it a good balance? I'm talking about mechanical systems, uh, the chemistry with fuels, um, range tracking, aerodynamics, materials. Uh, is it a balance or? Uh, across the company, all of those things. Uh, at, at White Sands Test Facility, for example, uh, we do mostly uh, liquid results. Um, we have done solids in the past, but it's mostly liquids. Uh, we deal with the hypergols. Those, those two, monohydrazine and nitrogen trioxide that you put together and we get the addition. So uh, we're, we're probably the, the, the best uh, location in the country to do heart valves. Maybe one of their few, because people don't like to do it. There's permits that you got to deal with, uh, and they're, they're nasty chemicals. But along with that comes chemistry, because if you got a nasty chemical in a system, you want to keep that nasty chemical in the system, so you better know how that chemical reacts with soft goods, and valves and fittings and, and those kind of things. So we have a, we have chemists at uh, at at the uh, uh, White Sands Test Facility uh, that deal with chemistry. We deal with li uh, liquid oxygen, um, especially high pressure liquid oxygen, uh, where you can get uh, if you have a particle that's traveling down a, a liquid oxygen system and it happens to impact on on the uh, so in an elbow or something, or in a fitting that's coming through a, a poppet, uh, you can get fire. Uh, go back to the uh, Apollo 1 fire. That's when we started uh, doing that kind of investigation. So we do a lot of chemistry with regards to compatibility of components and liquid oxygen. Um, obviously, aerospace kind of engineers, uh, all over the com company, uh, mechanical, electrical, a lot of controls of these facilities have a lot of a lot of, uh, of systems that have to have active uh, controls associated with them. Uh, so pretty much every discipline will have some some involvement in one of our contracts or the other. And oh, I'm sorry. more specialized in some places than others. All right, so different segments would have more specialization than others. Is for for different test areas? Yeah, for different kind of things. I mean, you know, a mechanical engineer would fit in in, in yes. any location. Electrical engineer would fit in in any location. Mm -hmm. Chemical engineers are going to be a, a little more aligned with uh, those segments like mine that are doing chemistry associated with propellants. I don't know, Brad, you probably don't have any chemists well, we, or... We do some, we do some chemistry associated with... Uh, you might have the map of... Oh, yeah. Of, yeah. Each one of those groups has a specialty according to what the, what the needs are. And 
that's a great example for uh, computational simulation. Uh, it, you see a lot of store separation from, from vehicles. There's a lot of a lot of simulation in that. We're at we're at eight of the NASA centers. There's ten NASA centers. We're at eight. Wow. All right. <coughs> All right. Thank you. All right. We just got three minutes left. Any any more questions? Yes. Are the uh, current uh, test facilities looking to uh, match expected uh, need in the upcoming uh, couple of next couple of years, or is it looking to expand? Right now, we're we're in this time uh, where we're transitioning from shuttle to constellation and whatever it turns out to be. You're gonna you're gonna have a panel that's going to talk about some of that later today at one thirty, I think. Uh, but, but there's a, I, can, I can speak for my, my segment, there's a lot of uncertainty in what's going to happen. We don't know what our workload's going to be. Uh, and some, some can be said uh, about the Department of Defense as well as what NASA is going through. So, you know, we're, we're a little bit uh, uncertain as to what our workload's going to be. 2010 looks to be kind of okay. But 2011, there's a lot of uncertainty. And, and matter of fact, and, and I, I hate to say this, but um, but today is the first time that I haven't had an open requisition for for a new employee in three and a half years, and it's because of our workload. Now that's not to say that Jacobs Technology does it somewhere, or Jacobs does it somewhere, and, and that's where you got to go out to the, uh, the websites and, and look around and, and find those things. Um, but uh, but that's partly because we don't know what's going to happen. Our industry. So I think the answer is we're, we're, we're not expanding. You know, we're trying to maintain stability and, and prevent, prevent much shrinking if it occurs. Breaking off on that same tangent, um, what kind of collaboration have you had outside of the federal contract area as far as like the private space industry? Have, have there been any talks? Well, we've actually done some of that at, at, uh, at, at White Sands. We tested the uh, armadillo engine that we use, use for X-Prize. Okay, it was a box of methane engine that we tested uh, there at, at White Sands. Um, we, uh, th th there was a, uh, an orbital sciences satellite that was damaged. It was uh, a Malaysian uh, satellite that was damaged uh, in Russia. And so orbital sciences, which is a you know, commercial company here in the United States, I said, gosh, what are we going to do? You know, they got this, again, a half a billion dollar satellite that's been damaged. We've got a decon it that had hyperbolic uh, fuels on it and oxidizer. And so we were able to, to, to support them. We put it in a test stand. We got all of the, the, uh, uh, the hypergols out of it. And as a matter of fact, that satellite they've been able to, to launch and uh, it is it is working well. So we do have collaboration with, uh, with the commercial communities. And we really support the commercialization of space. Um, you know, NASA would love for the commercial community to start start delivering uh, supplies, and that's why they have the COPS program uh, for the International Space Station. Uh, man's block, man uh, space flight is out there somewhere. I don't know how long it'll take to get the commercial community so that they can reliably do that. Um, but uh, but there's a lot of that, and and this current administration is big on that. And that will affect the Department of Defense as well as, as NASA. And that's good for us. Too. So I think our time's basically up. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you.